What a great Sunday it's already been. Thank you so much for joining us. For those of you that are online, thank you. And for the Fredericksburg campus, welcome, welcome. We've got a number of things that we're gonna do today. We are gonna take the Lord's Supper here in just a little bit, and you're gonna have an opportunity to, if you didn't grab one of our handy-dandy all-in-one packages, uh, our ushers will have those in a second. Hey, I wanted to take just a brief moment because today, historically, what we call today is Palm Sunday. And this whole week, uh, is very meaningful to me. And I will tell you, in 95 was when I realized what Easter was all about. And then as you go and you read about it and, and, you, and you hear the account of Palm Sunday, uh, you have on one side of Jerusalem, you have Pontius Pilate that is coming in. All right? And he is gonna be more than likely on a white horse there will be uh, a lot of fanfare. There'll be drums and trumpets and horns, and they're going to make this huge, massive processional entry and all of this. On the other side of Jerusalem, there's a man riding a colt, a donkey colt, a baby donkey. And I envision when Jesus is riding into town, this colt is so small that he is, his feet are almost dragging on the ground. And it's the people that are laying the palm branches down and rejoicing over this. You have two very different figures. One is it's all about me and the other one writing in and saying it's all about all of you. What a great picture. And so this is what Palm Sunday is in my mind. Father God, I come to you and I thank you so much. And there's a sense of boating that goes with this. There's a sense of... Um, of darkness and a little bit of gloom. But God, we know the rest of the story. And we know that yes, there's a Friday, but most importantly, we know that there's a Sunday. A Sunday where your son rises from the grave, has victory over death, and because of that, we have victory. And so God, this week, as we look forward to the Easter, the resurrection of Jesus, may we understand or begin to comprehend that this has always been your plan, that you would come, you, God, would come for us. Humbling is an understatement. Thank you, God, for loving us and being mindful of us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, again, good morning, everyone. Come on. Come. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, John. All right. Very good. Well played. Yeah, good morning, pal. There it is. Yeah. Hey, if you don't know me, my name is John Cook, and I'm the pastor of care and counseling here, and it is a joy to be with you, and it's a joy uh, to represent the Mount uh, this morning. And we are going to be going through Philippians chapter 2, uh, and we're going to continue in our series in Paradox, and uh, I love this one, and I think it's very appropriate to what we're doing here. But before we really dive into this, I want you to think, what, do you, what goes through your mind when you see this picture? Now, some of this will depend upon your age. If you're in high school or college and you're paying for your own gas, this is just how you roll. Yeah, you know that. It's how we roll. And by the way, Teens, college students, your mom and dad were your age at one point too, okay? We used to roll like this, but we learn because if you ever have to push a car that has run out of gas, this 
can actually bring a little bit of angst to you. Now, there's a new sense of angst that comes with this, with gas being upwards of uh, dabbling with and over $4 a gallon. I have to be honest with you, you poor suckers that have pickup trucks and Suburbans, oh my lands, my heart hurts for you. I had got to imagine that there is a point where you're just sitting there and you're just watching the dollar signs going and then eventually he goes, yeah, I don't care if it's full or not. I can't go over this. I, I just, it hurts too much to pay that much. I'll come back in two days and I'll put more in, but today is all I can do. Now, I'll tell you, I have, I have a little Honda Civic and I get a little angst when all of a sudden it costs me $45 to fill up my Civic. Now, I, I know. I probably look like a sardine crammed into my little car. I realize that. Six foot four in a little Honda Civic. It's the largest and the sportiest midlife crisis I could afford. So that's why I have it, okay? Yeah. So, but being empty can cause a bunch of angst for us. There's also some cool things about being empty. For example, when I go and I open up the dishwasher and I realize that it's empty, I'm like, yay, I don't have to empty the dishwasher. Or you go and you're like, well, I gotta take the garbage out. <gasps> Somebody took the garbage out because there's a fresh new garbage bag in there. That's really exciting. There's other times though with empty causes some grief, all right? What about that moment when you realize that the toilet paper roll is empty? What about that moment when you go to the ATM machine and you put it in, I just need 20 bucks, boop, 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 declined, yeah. Am I the only one that that's ever happened to? <laughs> I, oh my gosh, oh, I'm so embarrassed, yeah, yeah. Empty has good and it has bad. And that's kind of the physical stuff, but what about when we start feeling empty? What about the emotional and the spiritual emptiness that so many of us struggle with? And I'm sure that there are people in Sound of My Voice that are here in the Stafford or Fredericksburg or even online where you feel empty. You have been going and going and going and going and going and you are just going through the motions. And you feel like you've come to the end of yourself. Now, a lot of times what we do is, is we say, okay, it is time for a vacation. So we book a vacation and we go and we spend all this money and we find angst because we're spending money we don't have. Thank God for credit cards, as Dave Ramsey says, right? No, wait, I think that's, no. All right. <laughs> Dave, I'm getting a phone call from Dave Ramsey in Financial Peace this week, I guarantee you. You totally misread what we said. Yeah. Um, if you have not taken Financial Peace University, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about. For the few of you that have, you will, okay? Um, but we go on these vacations, and maybe we go to someplace exotic. Maybe we go out of the country, or maybe we go to the other, par or, or other part of the, the country, and we go to Yellowstone, and we see all sorts of nature and, and all this, and we run, and we run, and we run, and we're thinking that we're filling ourselves back up, but what we're doing, we're just doubled down in a new place and we're running at 110 miles an hour and we empty and we empty ourselves and we come back and we're just as tired if not more tired and more spent than when we left on vacation. Now, I don't know if that's y'all, I know it's for me. When I go on vacation, it takes me four or five days to calm down so I have a really good day, one good day on vacation and then the next three days, I'm fretting because, oh gosh, I gotta go back to work in three days. I was asked here, and maybe, and I don't know if this resonates with any of you all, but it, 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 one of those moments where it just crushed me. Somebody asked me one time, he says, John, what do you do to rest? What do you do to unwind? What do you do to fill yourself up? And I jokingly threw out, oh, I don't do it. I don't have time for it. And then I tried to actually answer the question. And there wasn't an answer there. You may have a problem if, that's one of those moments. Oh no, how do I refresh? How do I refill? How do I, and I didn't have an answer. We are gonna continue our series in paradox. And the paradox that I want us to look into ourselves is emptying ourselves so that we can be full. 
We're going to be in Philipp- or excuse, yeah, Philippians chapter 2. If you have your, your text with you, if you've got your Bible, if you've got your apps, whatever, go ahead and open up to this. Now, I would tell you, I love Philippians 2. This is a passage that I use often in working with young couples because it's talking about uh, looking to the interests of others above your own which I think is very important, funny, funny story. The very first wedding I did, I went to this passage and I, and I, I spoke to the wife uh, and I said, you know, you need to uh, look after your own interests, but also the interests of your husband. And I looked at the husband and I said, and you gotta look after uh, your own interests. And I left out the part about the interests of his wife's and he goes, oh, I can do that. But we're going to look at this. Let me just read this for you. I just want you to hear this. It's going to be up on the screen, so if you don't have it, but I want you to read, uh, I want you to hear this. This is Philippians chapter two. And again, many of you are going to be familiar with this, all right? Paul writes, he says, therefore, and that therefore is, he's going to be talking about unity within the church. In context, Paul is talking about how to keep unity in times and hard times and finding your joy and, and, fi- and rejoicing, being able to still rejoice in your hard times, all right? And he says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, and if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, a reoccurring theme that you're going to see here, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, he goes on, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, as I told you, if I'm taking this fully in context, Paul is talking about the importance of unity. And he's talking about being one in mind and one in spirit. And for a church that is going through some persecution, is having some problems, having false teachers coming in, the importance of unity is very, very, very important. That we need to be a unified group as we go out. Now, he'll go on later on in this chapter that, listen, we've got to live within this crooked and depraved generation, but if we will live this way, we will shine like stars. Imagine that. I don't know if you've ever been in a very desolate or deserted place, away from all the light pollution and everything, at night, and you can actually see the stars how brilliant they are in that night sky. It's crazy. Now, I'm not a camping guy, so I would go out for a half hour and something like that and then hop back in my car and drive to a a Marriott. But that's, you know, you get the idea, okay? We get to be those those stars in in that dark, dark sphere. But there's also a passage, an idea of this passage, and from a theological uh, uh, viewpoint, this is known as the kenosis passage. And the Greek word kenosis means to pour out or to empty. And it's the idea of Jesus pouring himself out for the betterment and for our behalf. But I believe that there is a tremendous lesson for us that we can learn from Jesus. So we're going to kind of parse this apart, these eight verses, and take a look at this. And so with that in mind, verses one and two in this. Therefore, if any of you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. Now he's going to start off there and he's going to say, listen, do you get anything out of being Jesus Christ? Do you get anything of being a follower of Jesus Christ? If you get anything, I'll use that like I said with couples. Do you get anything in being in Jesus? Yes. 
Do you, have you learned the idea of compassion? Have you learned the idea of empathy? Are you willing to sit with others and, and begin to hear their story instead of just judging folks and taking stereotypes and going, well, that person's that, that person's that. No, 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 no. When I'm in Christ, I realize that I come across other people. People have stories just as I have stories. And I don't want to be judged because of maybe the way I dress or my skin color or my lack of hair or whatever it is. I want you to know me for who I am. And I'm more than happy to tell you part of my story. And I think there's a number of people we come in contact with that if we're willing to, to sit down and we will learn about their story, it's much easier to do this. And these are things that we receive from Jesus Christ, the ability to sit down and to empathize and to learn about others. Now, Paul's going to go on. He goes, now, if you get anything in Christ, if you get anything in Christ, then I'm going to ask you to make my joy complete. Make your joy complete. He's going to go on. I'm still in verse 2. He says, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. What is it to be one in spirit and one in mind and one love? I will tell you the the, the idea of us coming together and being unified as a church and as a people, it's like a team, right? For a team to function effectively, for a team to put a winning product out on the field or, or something along those lines, we have to be goal-oriented. I cannot have, now as a baseball coach, we have nine guys on the field. I can't have nine guys thinking it's all about me. I need nine guys in the same mindset working for the same goal. And when they're doing that, they become unified. Within our relationships, as we come together with people, if we are unified, if we are showing love, not my definition of love, not your definition of love, not the other person's definition of love, but what God's definition of love is, that love is patient and that love is kind and it's not envious and it's not boastful, it's not proud, it's not rude, it keeps no record of wrongs. That type of love, if that's the definition of love we use and we come together and we're all on the same page with that, guess what that makes us? It makes us friends. It makes us one. It starts putting us in one. If we are all thinking in those same ideas, then we are moving in the same direction, which automatically makes you not my enemy. Make sense? All right. Paul's going to go on. He's saying, listen, by making my joy complete, by experiencing the joy of being in Jesus, and if you get anything out of it, be like-minded. Having the same love that Jesus has, being one in spirit, by being one in purpose. All of these things that we just talked about, verses three and four, Paul's gonna continue on. He says, do nothing, nothing. That's not some things, that's nothing. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, this is huge, do nothing out of selfish ambition. I'll be honest with you. I will pour out and I will pour out and I will pour out and I'll pour into you as long as you are giving me something back. That's a contractual relationship. That's a consumer mentality. I'm gonna give because I fully expect back. And if you don't give back, I'm done. Any of us have those mentalities? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Put your hand down. Yeah, no. But there's things that we need to think about, that we need to examine ourselves. Am I in this only for me? Or am I in it for someone else? Now, there's a number of things I can be super selfish about. And again, I may be the only person, but I don't think so. <laughs> I love how Paul's going on with this. He says, we do nothing just to feed ourselves. We do nothing just to build ourselves up. Remember Palm Sunday? 
Pilate's coming in. He's on the white horse. He's got the gold standard. He's got the drums and all that. He is saying, look at me. It's good to be Pontius Pilate. All right? And Jesus, when he comes in, he's like, no, it's about y'all. It's about you all, and I see you laying down palm branches, but you guys are missing the whole thing here. I'm not coming to establish a brand new, you know, worldly kingdom. I'm not. I'm about ready to really, truly, honestly pour myself out for you. And we, they totally missed it. And I will tell you, so much of the world even today still totally misses what Jesus did. Now, this is the kenosis passage. This is where we really start seeing where Jesus is truly pouring himself out. In verses five and six, Paul goes on and he says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Now, I will tell you, this is packed full of theology. All right, we could literally spend a couple of weeks just trying to unpack this because there's a lot of misconceptions here because we think that Jesus fully left behind all of his deity. No, that's not what he did. When Jesus, when God put on flesh, he made a willing decision to become human. Now, I want that to soak in for just a moment that our God loves us so much that he left the splendor of heaven put on flesh with its limitations of experiencing pain and hurt and to bleed and to feel. He willingly did that for us. This is huge. And so what God chose to do is that he came, put on flesh, and he poured out then to all of us so that we may have life. Oof. Oof. Paul goes on. Verse seven, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of his servant being made in human likeness. Now what Jesus does, God coming in the flesh is the man Jesus, though still fully God and could have said, you know what? I'm here. Come worship me. Do this, serve me. Instead, the model that he came, he became the servant. Mark chapter 10, verse 45, talks about, Jesus says, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and to be a ransom for many. A ransom. The price that needs to be paid to bring you and me and us from death to life. That's the example that Jesus gave. He could have exerted his divine power, but instead he showed us what it is. And in doing so, he poured out to us so that we could be filled with him. Oof. Verse eight, and this is kind of the culmination of this. And being, a found is, uh, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. This is the punchline, you ready for this? Because Jesus was willing to empty himself for us, we are made full in him. It is, and we will celebrate the resurrection on Sunday, Jesus came with the full knowledge that he was going to die for 
us so that we might live. Philip Yancey, I don't know if any of you all are familiar with any of his writings. In the late 90s, early 2000s, he was a very prolific writer, had a number of uh, very, very good books, The Jesus I Never Knew, The Bible That Jesus Read, uh, um, a book about prayer. They're, they're still very, very good books, all right? In one of those, he gives the analogy that he, is a, he has a saltwater tank in his home, fish tank. Anybody have a saltwater fish tank in their home? Anybody? Wow. Anybody at Fredericksburg? No? All right, it's okay. Yeah, we had one person in the last service, and I, of course, I got to think, if you're a saltwater guy, uh, you're a fool. Yeah, because they're so labor intensive. I one of the guys I went to school with in seminary, he had this massive, like, 150-gallon, 200-gallon fish tank. It was absolutely beautiful, but every day, you know, we're like, well, what are you doing? Oh, I got to go home and work on the fish tank. Man, you got to keep the temperature right. You got to make sure all the minerals are right. You got to make sure that the saline was right. You know, all this stuff. Phil Yancey talks about this, and he loved these fish. It was just one of his ways that he just found peace, was working on this. But he goes, it's crazy. Every time I would go there and I'd lift up the tank and to drop food in for him, they would scatter. And in a moment, he had this vision. He goes, oh my gosh, this is, this is God. This is God in us. Whenever God comes close to us, we scatter. We get, we're afraid. But what God is trying to do, listen, I want to provide for you. I'm making sure that your environment is set up. I'm making sure that you've got food. I'm, I'm making sure that everything's good for you. But when he comes close to us, we scatter. And Yancey says, the only way that I could ever communicate to the fish how much I care for them would be if I became a fish. God realized from the beginning the only way that these people that I love so much will understand how much I love them, will be for me to become one of them. And that's what he did. He emptied himself to fill us. Now, I will tell you, I believe in our busyness and in our desperate need for finding fullness, we pour ourselves out and we pour ourselves out and we pour ourselves out for ourselves. And in doing that, we lose the ability to find fullness in pouring into others. This is the example that Jesus gave to us he poured out so that we might live. The same goes for us. If I am pouring out just for myself, it will be empty. But if I'm pouring out and pouring into others, I find great fulfillment. I want to leave you with just a couple of steps that you can do here. First of all, I believe that there are daily filling processes, weekly filling processes, quarterly filling processes, and annual filling processes. Now, right off the bat, the daily one is what are you doing to be filled with Jesus? Because every day, you are, things are gonna be taken and you're gonna be poured out and you have to have things poured in. If you don't have anything pouring in and if you don't have Jesus pouring into you, then what is coming out is you. Now, y'all may be made way better than me, but I know when just John comes out, it can get really messy. And so I need that daily filling of Jesus. I wanna encourage you this week, the Passion Week, the last week of Jesus' life, all right? Go to Luke, starting in Luke 19. 
Go into the Gospels and read the last week of Jesus' life. And some of you go, I don't understand what's going on. That's okay. It's okay. Just eat the word right now. And this is where God says, listen, my Holy Spirit will give you the meaning of this, will give you understanding of this. But our job right now, maybe sometimes, is just to eat the word and just fill ourselves with that. And it's crazy when we do that and all of a sudden a situation will come along and all of a sudden there's this thought of the scripture that you read three years ago and you're like, there's an application right there. Ah. Oh. At least that's how the Holy Spirit sometimes work with, works with me. Wow. So fill yourself on a daily basis. All right. There's a weekly opportunity for you to fill yourself. Now, I would tell you, we are a church that we say we are a church for one more. And, and for me, the way I've got to dumb things down, that means it's always one more seat for another person. There's always room at the end for one more person to come. And one of the things within doing that, being a church that is constantly wanting to pour into others, pour into the next person, we give a number of opportunities. And we believe that these are spiritual opportunities and we believe that these are scriptural opportunities for you to participate with us. And our four core values are to invite, to gather, to give, and to volunteer. Those are our four core values. And we believe that each one of these helps us in not only being filled as we pour out to others. Invite, you all have a tremendous, we all have a tremendous opportunity coming up because Sunday is one of those days, Easter Sunday, people are really excited to come to church. They're at least thinking about coming to church. We can invite others. You know, when we invite you're putting yourself out there for the possibility of being rejected. I understand that. But they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. My job is to invite. And we've given you a, a tremendous amount of way to do that. Send a text message. Put it on your Facebook account. Do an Instagram post. Invite, invite. Second one, gather. I would encourage you on a weekly basis, and this is a weekly way for you to be filled, is to make Sunday mornings a priority. Make Sunday mornings a priority so that you can be filled. I will tell you for so many years, Sunday morning, or it still is, Sunday morning is a time where I get to be filled. You all fill me. And the more I pour out to folks, the more I get filled. A handshake, a fist pump, a hug. You all have no idea how that uh, just totally jazzes me. How you all, your presence here fills me. And I know I'm not the only one. So make Sunday morning, it's not a have to, man, we get to. We get to come and be filled here as I am pouring out, as we are pouring out to others. Our third core value is to give, and we're talking financially. We highlight, and I love being a church here that takes 10% of every dollar that comes in here, goes right back out to fill in the lives of others through our missions. Local, uh, statewide, national, and globally. We need your financial giving. You get to partner with us to do that. And you get to say, listen, this is a great way. As I give, as I pour out, I am able to pour into someone else and make a difference in someone else's life. Oh, it's not about what you're losing because it's not that at all. I'll be honest with you, it's never yours in the first part. God gives this to us so that we can do things for others and for ourselves. We look to our own interests, but we also look to the interests of others that Paul says. And then finally, our fourth core value is volunteering. I think this is a great opportunity. This can be a weekly thing 
where you can come in and you get to pour yourself out into someone else. And what you get in return is you get filled. Now that's a paradox. Our kids ministry, they are adamant about this. We are not childcare. We are about pouring in and discipling young children. I love that. You have the opportunity to volunteer in a kids ministry or a student ministry where you get to pour into the next generation. You get the opportunity to fill the lives of others and to talk to them about Jesus and to grow them and mature them and enter into their lives. Come on. We get the opportunity up in student ministry. Yeah, they play a lot of games and eat a lot of pizza, which is cool. But you know what Jason is doing up there? And Jason and Torger and all of you volunteers, you are pouring into the lives of others. We have mission opportunities that you can go to. Ugh. There's so many things. You could be a greeter. You could be an usher. Do you have any idea on an Easter Sunday when it may be hard to find a church or find a seat and there's a smiling face that has met you at that door and said, welcome. And maybe that was you when you came in here. Let's face it, this can be an intimidating church. It's a big place. And you walk in, you're like, man, take me a lot of guts just to walk up to the door. And then there's somebody there that just says, good morning, I'm so glad you're here. You need directions to anything? You just poured into somebody's life. You get to do that on a weekly basis. All right. There are, we got the daily fulfillment. We've got the weekly. We have quarterly. I would encourage you, and we have a perfect opportunity to do this because next week, we're gonna start doing impact week. And this is on a quarterly basis where you and maybe your family or you and some friends or you and a small group or you and even some coworkers, we get to go out and we get to do ministry. We get to pour into other people. And I would encourage you to do that on a quarterly basis. And maybe as a family, you go say, listen, you know, the third Sunday on, you know, every other month, we are gonna go out and we're gonna feed supper. We're gonna go down to the Brisbane Center and we're gonna feed supper. We're gonna make supper and we're gonna do that. Or we're going to go to serve. We're going to go to one of the partners that we have and we are going to pour into that so that we can pour into other people. And then ultimately there is the annual fulfilling. And this is where I would say that maybe even on a mission trip, I challenge you to test this theory. To ask anybody who has gone on a mission trip, ask them, if when they came back, they were empty or they were full. And I will tell you, they'll probably tell you physically, I'm empty. Spiritually, it's overflowing how filled I am. When I was in seminary, we had an opportunity. We were, we were told we had to go on a foreign mission trip and for three weeks I went to Tallinn, Estonia. Now, I'm the type of guy that I don't mind leaving the country but when we landed back in JFK, wheels touched down, I almost started to cry. I was so excited to be back in the United States. I realized that's fairly pathetic. I'm 20 years removed from this. But those three weeks in Tallinn, Estonia are forever imprinted on my life. About 10 days into it, I was sitting and I was talking with an older woman. Now, Estonia had been under communist rule for years. And when we got there, they had gotten their independence probably about five or six years prior to that. I am sitting with this old woman that 
knows about four words of English, which are four more words than I knew of Russian. And I'm working with a translator, I'm working with this woman, I'm reading through the Gospel of John because we're trying to teach them English using the Gospel of John. And she finally stops me after I've met with her for like a day and a half. And she finally goes, who is this Jesus guy? Who is this Jesus person is what she asked. I'm like, it's Jesus. She's like, I don't know Jesus. Because she had lived underneath communist rule for so long, she had never even heard of Jesus. She had no concept. There was no file folder for it. I got the great opportunity to tell her who Jesus is. 20 years later, I can tell you I am still full of that. And God allowed me to pour out to this woman, but I tell you, I got so much more in return. We have an opportunity if we will stop looking at just ourselves and really begin to look at others Allow Jesus to fill us. And then as he fills us, we have something to give and to pour out to others. What a blessing it is. Caleb Fredericksburg, I'm gonna turn this over to you here in just a second because we're gonna participate in the Lord's Supper. And I think this is a great idea that on today, Palm Sunday, and as we talk about this paradox of being emptied to be filled, what a greater way than to remember how Jesus emptied himself for us so that we can be filled by taking this memorial feast. Fredericksburg, have a great week. For those of you that are online with us still, I hope that you have some emblems there at home. And if not, you can always go out and do this later on today. Now as the believer, you know what this is. This is remembrance of the broken body of Jesus. Does everybody have the little cup? Does anybody need one? Pastor? As a believer, we know that Jesus implemented this simple feast, bread and wine. But there's such great significance in these. The bread represents Jesus' body that will be beaten and tortured and broken, but it is for us that he did this. He willingly poured out his life for us. At that night, right before he's betrayed, he sees on the table a loaf of bread and he grabs it. And scripture tells us this, and he broke it and he gave thanks. And then he tells his disciples that are sitting with him, this is going to represent my body. This is a representation of my body that is gonna be broken for you tomorrow. And I'm telling you this now so that you won't be grieving me. But they didn't hear. And again, we get to see the bigger picture. We get to see the end story. But he said it is with this. And so whenever we take this, this simple wafer, it is so much more because it is reminding us that Jesus, that God left the splendor of heaven and poured out his life for us. And so we take this bread and we remember the broken body for him. Take and eat. I envision that on that table, there was not only the loaves of bread and other things there, but there would be a, a clay pitcher that would be, or maybe a number of clay pitchers that would have had some wine in it. And Jesus is gonna pour this out into a cup. And then he's gonna go in and he's gonna say, and this is gonna be this crimson wine 
this red like blood substance is going to be an example of the blood that is going to be shared that is truly going to be poured out for you and he goes whenever you take this cup i need for you to remember that this blood washes you white as snow crimson in color but it washes us whiter than snow it says whenever you take this cup you do it in remembrance of me and you think of the blood that was share, shed for you that washes us and so we take and we drink Father God what a simple yet incredibly profound example in where we get to participate and remember how you left the splendor of heaven how you willingly chose to put flesh on for us and how you showed us what it is to be a servant not to come and be served but to serve others and you served ultimately in that you allowed your body to be broken for each one of us and for your blood to be shed and it is that blood that is sprinkled on us and washes us clean as snow god thank you that you are mindful of us and i pray this in jesus name amen now listen Many of you have next steps. We all have a next step every Sunday. And it's not to hurry up and beat somebody to the restaurant. Though it's helpful. We have a next step in our faith walk. And so this is my real question for you. What are you doing to be filled? It's the question that asks me, how do you fill yourself? And if you cannot answer that, you absolutely have a next step. Are you filling yourself with Jesus so that you can pour yourself out daily to others that you come in contact with? Some of you have never even accepted Jesus Christ and you've been just doubling down, trying to do everything in your own strength and in your own power and you are exhausted. My invitation for you today is that you would come and that you would accept Jesus and allow him to fill you because that's the fullness that you're missing. Whatever your next step is, our prayer team is gonna be up here. I will be up here. You are more than welcome to come and talk to me. In fact, I encourage you to do it. And we don't do it to embarrass you. We do it because we want to embrace you. Father God, I just ask that you would move us that you would move those whose hearts need to be moved and that you would give them your strength and your courage to make their next step according to your great will. Father, be with us and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.